what does Paul mean whenever he says wives to your husband, wives submit to your husband? But what do you think he had in mind for the women sitting in that church? Here's my takeaway from listening to Paul's letter to us this morning. Yeah, I'm thinking he's telling wives that with their, you know, like that with their husbands, that they are called to sacrifice for for the other people in their mm. lives. You know, that this is called and you can you can even think about it in the first century world. These women in these churches do not have the power that men have. Um, they simply don't. And yeah. so what Paul is saying is saying, yes, you know, in this world in which you live, you have to submit to your husbands. But you realize that you've got God who is over them. And then he says, and you also know that your husbands, they, they don't have the power in this world that they have in the Greco-Roman world. They are called to not only submit to you too, but they are also called um, to give up their lives for you. So I think it's even a, you know, those women, it would have been radical for those women to hear. I mean, especially if we pull this and we put it in with like first Corinthians and we take it with like first Corinthians seven, which it talks about the marital debt that husbands owe, um, their wives, marital mm. debt, sex, but wives, you know, wives owe it to their husbands, but husbands owe it to their wives. And then he says, you know, women, your bodies are your husbands, but your husband's bodies are yours. Mm. This is radical, this mutual yeah. sort of thing. This is not language women would have heard. And so I think women, you know, we hear submit and we're like, oh, what does submit mean? Blah, blah, blah. I don't know if those women would have even heard submit. What they would have heard is, oh my gosh, my husband is just like me in the eyes of God. Mm. I mean, it would have been the, I cannot even imagine. Yeah, we're both the called freedom. to submit. Yeah, that, that would have done. I mean, yeah. we, it, but because of the lens that we carry to the text, mm -hmm. we hear hierarchy where there is no hierarchy. Well, and if I'm understanding you correctly, we hear hierarchy where hierarchy is actually actively being dismantled by Paul. And, yeah. you know, I remember talking to someone, this was years ago, and she said to me, I just don't know why Paul, he, he, so few words for women, just submit to your husbands. I wish he had told me more. And as I started reading commentators, exploring this view, I thought, well, Paul didn't have to say anything more because that was already in some sense expected of women to have a submissive attitude. And so what does he have to do? He has to kind of turn the cannon, so to speak, and look at the men and say, you think you're in charge? No, you follow the example of Jesus. We all submit right. to one another. We all sacrifice exactly. for one another. We all put the other's interest before exactly our right. own. And he had to spend a long time doing it because most of the men the in that mount. room are you know, yeah. clenching their fists saying, hold on here, I didn't sign up for this. Uh, it, it, man, I just want to go through passage after passage with you. I'll just tell our audience again, well, ch yeah. check out the book. Cause there's great <laughs> ones, you know, first Corinthians 14, you know, some of you are probably wondering why Beth and I are both uh, very open to the idea of women teaching and preaching. And I'd say your interpretation of first Corinthians 14 among another, uh, an, among a number of other passages has been uh, tremendously helpful. And, and I've, I've enjoyed commentators who've shared those same things. Uh, I, I, I want to ask you a, a different question aside yeah. from this. Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the points that your book makes very well, and, and I've seen the same point made in uh, Kristen uh, Kobes Dumais' book, uh, Jesus yeah. and John Way, which I enjoyed. We, we interviewed her, gosh, about a year ago now. Was it a year ago? I don't know. COVID does weird things to your time. I know it does. <laughs> uh, Completely. In some similar points with Amy Bird's book, uh, Recovering from uh, Biblical mm -hmm. Manhood and Womanhood. Yeah. You know, uh, is one of the points that you all make and, and that I think you make a great case for is that the church has oftentimes been more shaped by the culture than it has been by the Bible. And again, I couldn't agree yeah. more with you on that point. But then I always get this uneasy feeling uh, that I know all generations do this. And so I can imagine someone <laughs> looking at your position and saying, well, you know, I think you've been shaped by the spirit of the age, maybe not so much by the right, but you've been shaped by the left. And I'm curious how you would respond so to that critique. Yeah, you know, that's actually what's really funny is that people keep trying to push me out of the evangelical <laughs> camp because of where I stand on women. And it's so funny to me because historically evangelicals used to support women in ministry, uh -huh. you know, and there it is. There's just that out there. And, um, and you can, you can try to deny it, but you know, it, there it is. To be clear, um, we wouldn't say other, all evangelicals, but there was clearly a stream of evangelicalism that did support it. <sighs> Or you're, you're, I, I would love to be told otherwise. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, so here's my other beef with it is that, and this also has to do with the whole ordination office thing, mm. is we try so hard to say, to draw lines about when, what women can't do and to mm -hmm. put them in these things. And if we look at history, 
women mostly just don't care about the limits that men put on them. If they feel really called to God, they just go surf. Yeah. And so it doesn't, you know, I mean, I'm even thinking about the TGC review of my book um, where he got fixated on Bridget, you know, which, I mean, I did call out that Bridget um, was accidentally ordained. But this is actually funny in the medieval text because Bridget didn't need the ordination. Um, she's acting like mm. a bishop. She does all the work of a bishop. Everybody recognizes this. And then we have this funny story where this priest accidentally ordains her because he's drunk. Um, <laughs> and but she she doesn't. Need I just it. I gotta say I she love does. the Middle Ages. The stories you know in church. Is like, <laughs> then my pastor was drunk well, and I'm, just accidentally ordained her. I mean, how does that happen? Exact, <laughs> you know, it's so it's it's hysterical. It is a funny story. Medieval yes. people thought it was funny too. Um, and so the point of the story isn't that she's ordained. The point of the story is that her authority is already recognized in what she is doing and that everybody accepts yeah. it. And so, I mean, this the is irony the thing for me too. hearing that, by the way, is that that sounds like my view. I, I, I'm in this weird place hearing you say, say, yes, absolutely. She was out there doing it. And I want to say 100%. She just wasn't ordained and whoops, she got ordained, but she didn't even need so what, what does ordination <laughs> matter? I mean, that's yeah, where it comes down. That is a is fair, why are question. we, mm -hmm. why are we drawing lines yeah. when women are just doing the work of God? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, because essentially those lines are trying to push women. They're trying to push women out from doing this work. And and I mean, so instead, what we do is we see women having to go around all these barriers to be able to do what God wants them to do. They end up often doing it anyway, but their journey is much harder. And it's like, what if we just let them do what God called them to do? And that's yeah. really it. And I agree with that. I, I want I want my, churches to do that. Yeah, <laughs> which is my radical. And because I say that. People tr keep trying to push me out hmm. of um, of my evangelical world. And I'm just like, y'all, you don't know me. You do not know how much my theology is yeah. probably very similar to your theology. Yeah. Um, you just can't accept that I could be at the place where I am and believe that God calls women and men to serve in the same ways. Hmm. They, I mean, that can't that's not conceived. So I would say, first of all, they're um, they're wrong about what shaped me. Yeah. Um, because I'm shaped more by conservative evangelicalism than I am by progressive evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. So their assumption about what's shaping me is wrong. Um, the other thing is, is that I, and this is one of the things I did in the making of biblical womanhood, is I came out full force with what my lens is, what my biases are. Mm. It's funny that I got pushback against that. People were like, oh, you were too honest about that in this show. And I was like, but this, I'm very aware of what my bias is. Yeah. And this is where I'm coming from. Um, most people don't admit their biases hmm. and my thought, you know, what if we give ourselves, you know, what are the lens, what are our lenses that we're looking at the Bible with? Are we willing yeah. to, and this is what deconstruction, you know, so many people are deconstructing their faith and I'm like, no, 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 we're not deconstructing our faith. We are just deconstructing the things we have added to faith. Mm -hmm.